Hi, everyone. Welcome to Talon Talks. My name is Melissa Luna, Outreach Coordinator at the Talon. In honor of Month of Communication and Women's History Month, we have a panel discussion hosted by the Communications Club called Empowerment Through Communication. This conversation tackled a variety of issues, including how to communicate effectively and seek empowerment while overcoming uh, sexism and racism in the workplace. Without further ado, here is Professor Rachel Richardson and Communications Club President Diana Serrano. Hi, hello everyone. I hope you're all doing well and hanging in there. Um, as Dr. Newman mentioned, my name is Rachel Richardson and welcome to Empowerment Through Communication brought to you by the MSJC Comm Club. Um, before we get started and I pass it over to Diana, I just wanted to say a brief thank you to everyone who is joining us in the audience. Also, thank you to our fantastic panelists. We really appreciate some of you taking your time to visit us on a Wednesday night and give us some of your words of wisdom. So thank you very much to all of you for being here. We greatly appreciate it and couldn't do it without you. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to our fantastic club president, Diana, and she's going to introduce our panelists and give them our questions. Thank you so much, Rachel. So, um, yes, yeah, something I really want to bring light on right now is um, what Communications Club kind of like is, kind of get into that, and then we'll get into introducing the panelists. So, something that we really bring, want to bring light on in Communications Club is um, education through communication, right? We really hope to emphasize how far communication can get us in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, so now that you guys have like that background information, let's get into introducing our panelists. So Pamela Fisher is a major Metro newspaper and magazine editor since 1996. Pamela is an assistant professor of journalism and director of the Digital Media and Communications Bachelor's Program at Azusa Pacific University and the Strategic Communications Master's Graduate Program. Her research interests are in historical journalistic narrative frames and the way in which they shape culture. She holds a master in creative nonfiction at Miami University and teaches future, feature writing, arts journalism, religion reporting, and digital storytelling. She has two children, Dr. Alyssa Fisher and Zan Fisher, a Black Labrador and a husband, Reverend Terry, who is a minister. She loves to travel and has taken four cruises in the last year. So give it up for Pablo Fisher. <laughs> Yay. Um, okay, so next is Cindy Lemke. In 2018, Lemke joined an authority real estate and has and has since enjoyed learning how to serve homeowners in and around Southern California. And her biggest accomplishment was getting the chance to list a multi-million dollar listing and selling it. Lemke is very involved with her community, doing things such as being a lector and parish council for Holy Spirit Catholic Church, secretary for John R. Williams Memorial Scholarship Foundation, past president of Kiwani's Club of Hemet, and much more. Sydney Lemke has been in Hemet, San Jacinto Valley since 1986, and is a daughter, a wife to Jody for over 25 years, mother to four children, and granny to five children. <laughs> so when the hashtag marketing realtor isn't in the office or volunteering, you'll often find her spending time with her family. So... Cindy Lemke. Um, next is Shannon Moss. Dr. Shannon Moss is a, has a Juris Doctorate from Southern Western School of Law and a Bachelor of Arts in Communication from Brigham Young University. She's been in the public eye through some publications, articles, and appearances, such as I Met What I Said and I Said What I Meant, Legislature versus Legislature versus the Courts, and a Fox News interview concerning governmental governmental child support actions. Some of her skills include litigation and training plus teaching where she provides in-house instruction of legal writing, research evidence and much more. She has been a trial lawyer for over 31 years and is a family law certified specialist. Outside of her practice, she enjoys traveling, music including vocal, piano, organ and violin, violin and fiction writing. <laughs> um, moving on to Alma Ramirez. Dr. Alma Ramirez has served as a faculty in San Jacinto's English department for 17 years. She received her bachelor's in English from UC Riverside and master's education in reading, writing, and literacy from University of Illinois at Chicago and an EDD in organizational leadership 
from Pepperdine University. She joins us as Dean of Instruction, San Jacinto Academic Programs. As a faculty member, Dr. Ramirez co-coordinated the Puente Program, co-chaired the Inclusion of Diversity, Equity, and Accessibility Implementation Team. Currently, Dr. Ramirez is the Dean of Instruction for Academic Programs at the San Jacinto Campus and Libraries and Learning Resource Centers district-wide, and has served and continues to serve the MSJC community for 20 years. So I hope that gives you guys all a little background on all of our panelists um, and what they do and how their insights are going to help us today. Um, so I think this would be a good time to get into the questions unless somebody else has something to want to say or everyone's good. Yeah, okay. So the first question I want to ask is um, this event is all based around empowerment through communication. So how would you define empowerment and why do you feel it's important? So I'll jump in. Um, I think autonomy is a factor for sure. And I seek out workplaces that delegate responsibility and authority, and they support a woman's agency to manage and lead. And so some of the places that I've worked um, will give you a title, but there's uh, someone male often, you know, sort of over your shoulder, micromanaging. And um, so I'm looking for I think autonomy. I look at, if I don't mind me jumping in, I look at empowerment as a process and it's the process of um, becoming better, becoming more in charge of yourself, becoming more uh, active in your own goal setting, um, being in more control of your life essentially. And it's, it's a continuing action. It's not something that ha happens all at once or even you know, here I am at 60 something years old and I'm still working at becoming empowered. So it, it's a process and it changes for every step of life or every step of your career that you're in. I love both of those answers. And I, I think even um, for us to simplify it, it's uh, the opportunity to make decisions. And, and really, we can we can do that at any level from supervisor down to, you know, the lowest staff, we, we the opportunity to make a decision for what we're doing, because it gives it invests you in the project you're working on the thing you're doing or to think outside the box of what's going to happen the riff, ripple effect, if you will, you know, so once we own those decisions and are comfortable and confident to make those decisions, no matter what level it's on, I think it's important and it's empowering to know that you made that decision. I would agree with all three. I, you know, just, I would also add, I think it depends on the institution, right? Or the business that you're working with or, you know, where the context of what that means. And I agree that the autonomy, the, um, the value of, you know, the work that you do. Um, and I think for me, it's like being affirmed in that work, right? I want to have the autonomy to make the decisions, but I also want, I want it to, um, to reverberate, right? Like I want folks to know like, yes, that, that decision was um, in the best interest of whoever your constituents are, your stakeholders like that. So I would say what they said, uh, what she said and she said and she said, and also just, you know, val being validated and affirmed in our, in our own empowerment. Yeah, so I honestly loved all for um, what it means to you guys, and I love to hear how it's important. So kind of like bouncing off of that, I want to know in what ways do you guys feel empowered on a day to day basis? You know, how do you guys manage to stay empowered? Um, I'll jump in. One of the ways I try to stay empowered is, is setting goals and accomplishing them during the day. Uh, empowerment doesn't necessarily have to mean somebody comes by and pats you on the back. It can be the realization of making and keeping and accomplishing your own goals. Um, some of the other kind of day-to-day -day things, 
for example, in trial, it's always nice to have a pat on the back from the judge or a pat on the back from a colleague or, you know, asking for help. Um, I do a lot of mentoring of the young attorneys because I'm old uh, in the office. And I think that's empowering when they come to you for help and you're willing to help them. Um, so there's a lot of little things that you can look for in the day. Doesn't always have to be you're up on the stage getting a big award. It can be those little tiny day-to-day -day things. And, and sometimes those are the most important. I'm gonna just add to that, to agree with Chandra, um, Dr. Moss on her, uh, just her take on it. I agree, I think for me, it's um, when I know that I'm doing something that is fulfilling my why, right? That I know that like, as small as it is, right? Um, you know, this these are not easy roles, being leaders, being um, uh, tasked with some hard decision-making. It, it could be at times um, discouraging, right? <laughs> um, but for example, this morning I observed a class, a face-to-face -face class of a faculty member, and it was, it was great. I, I felt joy. <laughs> I felt joy being in that, and it just, it just affirmed. I felt empowered that I could, like, I was in that space, and that I could speak to the great work that our faculty are doing in the classroom. So though it, it's these little things that just continue to feed my why that makes me feel empowered. That's so interesting that you would say that, Alma, because uh, my response was around a mentor who, uh, a female dean who hired me um, to create this new program. And um, she completely delegated the responsibility to design this BA completion program because I was an, uh, raised in an ESL household, single mom, uh, put myself through college, took about six years to do it, worked full time, um, was married in school. So I was that non-traditional student. And so she let me do it in a way that um, met the needs of people like me. And so um, she let me design the course curriculum, hire the faculty. I represented the program as it made its way through academic cabinet. And I'm a professor of practice, so I am not um, a theoretical um, academic by any stretch. Um, and so, but she didn't micromanage me because she really trusted me to create a program that I would be proud of. And um, she left the year I was launching the program to become a provost and I was heartbroken, uh, but we remain friends. And she's just been really instrumental in my life over these last five years, um, affirming me in that way that you are today. Yeah, again, these are all amazing uh, contributions. And I think another way um, to feel empowered is, you know, you know, knowing your self-worth um, because you work hard to be where you're at at that moment and you know what you can contribute. And just knowing that you have something to offer is empowering. Um, and, and we talked about decisions earlier and knowing that you can make decisions that may possibly influence someone to inspire a momentum that will help others around you is empowering. You know, you, you um, are important and you make a difference in every day. And, and I think just acknowledging that um, and inspiring that in others is empowering. Um, just on a little level. Yeah, so I would absolutely agree with um, every answer. I loved every answer, um, especially how, like we mentioned, it was, it's your everyday things. You send little, you set little goals for the day and then you accomplish them and you manage to uplift yourself. And that's how you, you know, don't feel like bad about yourself, like on a day-to-day -day basis. I really love that and answer, those answers. Thank you guys. Um, so another question I have is, how do you and your colleagues help enforce equity and how can superiors do the same? I think one of the biggest ways is having respect, uh, respect for yourselves, respect for um, just everybody. You know, uh, in the law profession, and, and I'm going to talk about women 
because that's really my experience. Um, I can remember at the beginning of my career 31 years ago that you very rarely saw a woman in the courtroom and certainly not as a litigator. And um, I can remember some of the ways that my male colleagues treated me and some of the judges treated me because I was in that minority. And I try to remember that when I'm, when I'm mentoring uh, new attorneys that are coming in, whatever uh, group they belong to, and that ethnicity, uh, their orientation, anything like that, because I know what it was like to sit there and be ridiculed by my male colleagues. I mean, it was so, there were some instances where, I, I, I'm not expressing this very well because sometimes this is a little hard to remember 30 years ago, but I can even remember walking into the courtroom and all of the chairs for the attorneys were set at a height for men. And I'd sit there and my feet would dangle and fall asleep while I'm waiting for a case to be called. But um, by playing mentor and using your skills and bringing everybody into the fold, so to speak, to help them improve themselves, I think is one way to create that equity. Uh, superiors, I think, need to look at themselves as mentors or uh, assigning mentors um, and being inclusive. Uh, and again, my practice has spanned, spanned generations. Um, it's not so bad well, I can't say not so bad. It's better than it was 30 years ago, but there's a lot of room for improvement. I'm seeking out training. Uh, I just did a um, survey not too long ago about training issues and things that we needed to work better on. Some of these equity issues get swept aside in just the everyday trying to get your work done, but it's important to be all inclusive. We get a broad range of experience from everybody we work with. Everybody is at a different level, right? So I might have a new attorney uh, come in. I have a variety of cases in family law, so I see everything. But I might have a new attorney come in that, you know, maybe needs some help with handling a uh, uh, gender issue or a even a religious freedom issue. I've had a couple of those. Uh, dealing with different viewpoints, because you can't guarantee Who's walking through your door, right? When you're in private practice. So you have to be able to understand where everybody is coming from in order to be an effective advocate and an effective attorney. I think it's the same way at the in, in an institution of higher ed. Um, and I first of all, I consider myself someone who is a lifelong learner, as I'm sure many of you in this space and room do as well. So um, I know that I have my own biases. I know that I've come with my own experiences um, that inform some of those biases, right? And we all have unconscious biases. I think it's, for me, it's um, one, understanding where every, that we're all at different stages in our learning, especially when it comes to equity. Uh, folks still confuse equity with equality. Um, and, and there's still a lot of debate and conversation about what equity is in terms of, you know, um, you know, also conflating it with diversity and, and, you know, inclusion and accessibility. Um, but it really is about meeting folks where they are. Um, it really is about fairness. Equality isn't that's, that's not how we define um, fairness. That's how people interpret it a lot of times, but it, it really isn't. Um, it's about respect. It's about knowing that our experiences and our lenses um, are not, you know, they're complex. They're complex. And so um, for me, I think in my various roles, I, I, you know, I often look to my own lenses first. I often look to my own study, right? Like what have I learned, uh, whether it's theoretical or, or practical, you know, the practice, my own praxis, my own ethos, my own values. Um, and then just kind of, you know, it's, it, it's, it's work. <laughs> when we talk about equity, we're talking about really um, 
shifting your mindsets, right? Really re-examining, questioning. Um, and, and so I think I just, I try to embody that with, you know, with folks that I'm working with, trying to understand where they're coming from, trying to ask more questions and hopefully, you know, and I know, I think this is something that, this is one of the questions you ask um, later on, but I, I would say that's, that has been a challenge for me as a woman, especially as a woman of color, is that I, I do, I, I ask a lot of questions um, because I'm curious, because I wanna learn more, because I wanna be more effective, because I wanna know how I can support whether it's students or faculty or staff. And sometimes that's seen as like, well, what is she poking around for? <laughs> what does she wanna know that for, right? So it, it's misrepresented or misinterpreted. Um, so anyhow, all that to say, like, I think equity is very <laughs> complex. Um, and I hope that in my work that I'm able to at least embody my own values and belief systems and my integrity and understanding of how I, um, how I see equity is, is important for the work that we do in the classroom. You know, I, I think uh, it's just as important in the business world, um, equity. I love what you said about serving people kind of where they are, right? So when we talk about networking and trying to build our business, you can't just try to sell all the time. And equity sometimes is taking a moment when you're at an event or you're at a network to learn a little bit about the person in front of you. How can you help them get to their next goal? Because it might not be about you selling your product or service at that point in time to that person, but you're building relationships to help grow your business through serving them at that moment. Where are they? What are they trying to achieve? And how can I help them? You know, it's humanizing the um, sales world, I guess. I don't, business can be a, a really tough uh, place to be. Uh, but if you set the standard of, you know, how can I help you and how can we collaborate? It's a completely different vibe. Like it's just, you're setting the tone of how can we work together? How can we collaborate? How can we enhance our services by including each other. Um, and I think equity has a lot to do with knowing who's right in front of you and giving them just a few minutes so that you can speak about who they are and what they do and how you can help them. You know, um, um, I think we have to kind of change, and this is something we're gonna talk about later, but but when we want to when we want to create momentum to go forward and change things, you have it's it's an ever it's lifelong learning right but the, it's it's constantly training new ways to do things to co to connect with your um community to build your business through service you know um no matter what you what you do for a living you have to be able to serve to make an impact for it to last longer than that moment of that sale so so equity is about listening and knowing who is right in front of you in, in my opinion So Cindy, I love what you've just said. Um, unless you um, have franchise and the ability to have agency in your organization, um, it's just uh, impossible uh, to make the change, to, to help shape change. Um, and so I, because I'm old and um, I, um, have been in a lot of really racist, sexist places um, uh, from the 80s to the 90s, really just even recently in the 2010s. Um, I just do not accept positions any longer in organizations without significant representation of female executives because I want to be able to exercise all my gifts and I'm just tired of swimming upstream and, um, and people of color because that also speaks to uh, gender equity. Um, if if they're not yeah. making room for people with a different worldview and different enculturation, um, it's just problematic. And it's um, it's just the vestiges of colonialism, really, that only a white male 
can performatively tell us what leadership looks like. So younger people, I would say, just be bold when you're searching. Make sure that you're not going into places where you're going to be marginalized. And you'll have no franchise to help shape the future of change. And, and be discerning about that. Because if you're getting vibes in interviews uh, that you are less than, that is not the place for you. That's going to be a place of trauma. Um, and uh, I think who they hire to lead is just telling you so much about who they are. So really research their executive team. Um, when I did campus recruiting, um, uh, I was hiring journalists for the USA Today Network. I've worked for them several times in the North, in the Midwest, and then in the South. Um, I definitely intentionally sought out diversity candidates. And I mean um, students of color and um, people who were ESL and maybe still had a pretty strong accent. Um, those with disabilities, I have a non-neurotypical child who's on the autism spectrum, um, but is brilliant. And then um, women and particularly first generation women, because there's a sense that I do not belong here, right? and guilt that you've left your family members behind. And the single uh, experience that kind of told me all I needed to know about this one site is that the, I interviewed 40 students uh, all across the country for um, a features reporting job. This was just a couple of years ago, actually, um, before I came to APU. And the most qualified student came out of UT Austin and she had a digital media degree and she was incredible. And she also spoke Spanish. And we were in a market that was close to Miami and you needed to be a Spanish speaker to do a lot of interviewing. It was just important. And I brought them the top two candidates. I told them she was my choice. I really didn't think there was gonna be a problem. And this is just before I was to go to that campus and begin coaching them. I was a storytelling coach. Um, they didn't want her because we had a television show and her accent was too strong. And I was horrified. I grew up with a grandmother with an eighth grade education who had an accent, who did not have great grammar. And it, I just felt shame on behalf of that organization. And I have to tell you, I saw many other examples after that one uh, that that they were telling me who they were right then. So when you go into an organization and people tell you who they are, believe them. It was not a good fit for me. And I think that young woman escaped a, you know, a landmine of a situation. So be discerning. So I really like hearing everybody's experience and hearing everybody's, um, what everybody really said. I think that there's a lot of like change to be made. Um, so I really want to know like what change should we be striving for and how can we make it happen? Well, it sounds like, oh, go ahead. Uh, no, I go was ahead. just going to jump in because I really like what uh, Pamela Fisher offered around, um, you know, the colonization and just like white supremacy. And, you know, this is something that like I've personally just reflected on over the years, again, as a first generation, for first generation um, daughter of immigrants, um, first, you know, first in my family to graduate from college, first, you know, to get a doctorate, first to be in an administrative role as I am. And I'm finally convinced that I, we are not the problem here. <laughs> we as individuals, as women with, you know, lots of skill sets, very varying diverse skill sets. Like we, the, the problem many times is the systems or the institutions or the organizations that we, we, you know, we work for that, that we, um, that, 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 um, so anyhow, all that to say is like, if you can somehow get to a place of understanding that this is not whatever is happening here, you know, whether it's a traumatic moment in that workplace or, an, 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 you know, trust your gut. Some, sometimes your gut is very much in tune with what's happening. And so um, I don't know if, you know, continuing to educate ourselves, continuing to nudge and push others to educate themselves, um, continuing to be advocates and um, social justice warriors and uh, learn about what the what do those terms even mean when we talk about um, coloniz colonizing ways and, and suprem white supremacy and, and equity and equality and, and, and to really just, you know, that's one way of empowering yourself when you have the not just um, the knowledge and the information, but the the language to be able to speak um, 
about those issues, right? So that's how I would, hopefully I answered that. It's kind of everywhere. <laughs> you know, when you're looking at change and you're looking at trying to make systematic changes, nothing happens fast, you know? So I think in seeking change, you have to be a little realistic when you set your goals and what am I going to do to forward this idea? Um, I worked on a legislative review committee for the Family Law Executive Committee from the uh, Lawyers Association. And let me tell you, I watched the legislative process and you would be, well, maybe you wouldn't be shocked about what happens and the, how slow it goes. And everybody's got their little changes and their pet amendments. And, you know, my constituency wants this, or I'm thinking about reelection next year, so I don't want this in there. It's slow and it's a process, but when you're bold and you speak about it and you know that that change needs to happen, you know, you encourage others. Um, I think about my um, oldest daughter who is a social worker. And one of the things that she has taught her grands, taught my grandson is to be bold and to um, strive to make those changes. He's a little guy. I mean, he, you know, 10, he's 10 years old right now. But I still remember when uh, she took him, she took him to a protest at their state's Capitol building. And uh, he was interviewed and, and asked, well, it, it had to do with immigration reform. And at a time when, um, let's just say there could have been better, better ways to deal with things. Uh, and his point to the uh, interviewer was, I want these kids to have the things that I have. I have toys, I have a bed to sleep in. And he wasn't afraid to say that and to say that to somebody like a, a reporter, you know? So we need to be bold. And as women, we need to be bold. We need to support each other. Uh, there's a lot of good women's empowerment groups out there that can teach you the skills. Um, Take some of uh, doc, the other Dr. Moss's classes. He's got some good, uh, yeah, there you go. He's got some really good ideas on how to be able to communicate these ideas in a way that's persuasive, that you can make your point known. It's just don't be afraid. You know, I, when my, in my younger years, I was afraid. But uh, as we get older, I think we learn how to overcome that fear. And once you overcome that fear, there's a whole wide world open to you that uh, where you can make a difference. Um, I think scarce role models uh, would be the significant barrier. And so um, like Chandra, I am a little bit older. <laughs> and, um, and so when I was, you know, working in the 90s and the aughts and the 10s, um, there still were not a lot of women at the executive and, and department head level. And so um, I mentioned that I was at three different USA Today sites. And one of them in the Midwest, I was the only woman at the table leading an editorial team in a newsroom of 205. And um, that is kind of typical because um, the news executives get together um, to represent their teams every day and figure out what's going on the front page at the top of the website. And you're, you're really, you know, it's like legislation, you're lobbying and fighting about what's going where. And um, so like crime and Metro and business and sports are all men still pretty much in every newspaper in the country. Um, and the newsrooms are loud, they're combative, uh, people are blue, they swear a lot. And so if you cannot assert yourself, um, you're going to get talked over in a meeting, and then your team loses out because they don't get that spot on the front page that your, your story package really deserves. And so you learn uh, to be assertive when you don't have a role model by trial and error, and sometimes it's you come across a strident or shrill, right? But um, we need more women to learn from because you have to have a social script for that. And then um, the last newsroom I was in, the one that didn't hire the young Hispanic woman who was from one of the four best digital journalism programs in the nation. Well, um, when I went to do a permanent re relocation down there because they'd offered me one of their top three jobs, 
they refused to pay me a $3,000 relocation bonus that all four men editors who had just been hired got. And their reasoning was that I was not the head of a household and did not have a family to support. So I think that's really problematic. And then after I left, I determined I was gonna go into academia. I just had it with that whole mindset. Um, I found out that the man on my team that I supervised, who was my assistant editor, made 20% more than I did. He had 10 less years of industry experience and he did not have a graduate degree. So remember what I said, young people, when somebody tells you who they are at the outset, believe them, it's only gonna get worse. Um, okay, so I'll just jump in. So yeah, honestly, I really like, um, I noticed, I don't know if everybody else noticed that almost like every answer was based around um, communication, you know, like being bold and that's to do with communication, that's to do with like your words. And um, that's really what this is like centered around, right? Like how to feel empowered through communication. Um, so I want to ask, what do you believe is the most significant barrier to female empowerment? I'm going to jump in here because I've experienced this bias. And it's not just necessarily bias of the majority of uh, the, per the people in your profession. Sometimes it's your own biases that get in the way. And not necessarily, oh, I don't like this or I don't like that, but you're biased against yourself. You know, um, I can't do that. I don't have that capability. You know, I used to, and, and this is probably not what anybody should do who wants to be a lawyer, but I'd watch uh, like LA Law while I'm going to law school and I'm like, or, you know, whatever the legal program was, I think I can't do that. What makes me think I could even do that, right? I had to learn pretty fast because I was, pushed into a trial six weeks after I became an attorney when my boss abandoned me to go take care of another case in the middle of a criminal trial. So I had to learn to overcome that feeling of helplessness, I guess, pretty quickly uh, in order to pick up that trial. But sometimes we, we start talking in our heads about uh, what I can't do, you know, what uh, lack of skills I have. And then it becomes that self-fulfilling prophecy. You want to pull yourself out of that and instead reaffirm the things I can do that I can do great. I'm great on cross-examination. Dr. Moss knows I love cross-examination. He's laughing, but that's okay. Um, I'm good at that. Okay. So I can pat myself. The rest of the trial might've been, you know, a uh, I won't say it in public, but um, might have been a disaster. But boy, I did a great cross-examination job on this person. Then the other thing, too, I think that kind of gets in the way is our inability to say no. And, you know, your boss comes up and he's got this huge project and wants it done five minutes ago and your desk is already full. And what do most of us as women have a tendency to say? Sure, you know, I might have to work till three in the morning, but yeah, I'll take it. Instead of setting that boundary and saying, no, I can't, I've got all of these other deadlines that I've got to meet, and I just know I won't be able to do a good job. Yeah, Alma just noted, I'll take care of it. That's what we say, you know. So, you know, we need to learn how to uh, not let people micromanage us, right? Not to... Um, to be overscheduled. How many times do we overschedule ourselves? You know, some of the challenges are self-care, right? Uh, I've got another comment here from Jade. We feel like we have to work extra hard to be taken seriously. And when you're in a male dominated field, you do feel that way, you know, in order to be noticed. Um, I'm right now I'm at the, I don't wanna say the peak of my career. I'm not ready to retire yet, but I'm close. At the very beginning, you, you did have to work extra hard. You know, I had to make extra noise in the courtroom just to be heard, you know. Um, 
Sometimes I did slam my hand on the desk or throw a, I did throw a pen at a judge. I'm not proud of that moment, but, but we just have to realize where we are in that moment, right? If you're too busy, it's okay to say no. It really is okay to say no, because you also have to factor in that you can't be everywhere all the time and be everything to everybody. So sometimes we stand in the way ourselves because we don't look at things that way. And I, I think we, we, we all know what the barriers are, but I think, I think we have to be focused on just a couple of things. We have to show up, we have to be consistent, we have to do our job, and we have to know what our boundaries are. As women, not only do we work harder, but we say yes more often. You're only doing yourself a disservice for doing the best job that you can do. So you, if you try to just focus on showing up, being consistent, working hard and doing your job, that should be enough. And I think part of the change that comes through and part of what we're, we're moving forward with in this momentum for equity and equality is to really deal with the people in front of us to pave the way for those that are coming through behind us. So we're steady setting the new standards and we're being consistent together and we're working together and we're, we're doing all of this together for that momentum that we're working for. Um, sadly, nothing does come quickly, right? But I think it's panels like this, it's, it's the groups that, um, Doc, that uh, Mrs. Moss was talking about. It was uh, all of these things that we can do, the self-education. Um, don't isolate. That's the worst thing that you can do. There are, there are people out and around you that feel those same feelings that you have. We're all overwhelmed at times. We're all nervous at times, but you need to talk through those things and find someone. And don't re be afraid to reach out to those people that are within your community, right? So it's, it's, I put my email in the uh, chat box because we probably have way more in common that you can, you can even think of. Um, but one of the things that we have in common is that we want to be better tomorrow. So there's always going to be someone that's going to be there here for you to help you through it and be better tomorrow. Um, so I, I don't want to talk in circles, but it's kind of, I, I'm, I'm just, thank you so much for what we're accomplishing together, right? Right now, I think it's so very important. So I, I echo what I've heard so far. Um, if I can just summarize it for myself, I would say, um, well, the patriarchy, right? <laughs> still, that's a big barrier. <laughs> we still uphold the patriarchy. Um, and it's like a heavy load for many of us. Um, because some, and I'm just gonna, you know, self-sabotage, which is what, you know, I think Chandra spoke to as well, just, and, and uh, um, Cindy. Um, and then, you know, I know it's, it's kind of a, it, it's kind of cliche to say this, but I think it's a reality. Like sometimes women not supporting women is, is it, it stands out, right? I'm sh and then that, that um, I think without, you know, I got these questions right when I was walking over here thinking, oh my God, and there were questions in that email. <laughs> um, I think sometimes we do a disservice to each other, empowering each other, um, uplifting other women, um, because we sort of buy into, we, we, we find ourselves in the, the vortex or the culture of the patriarchy um, that we forget that we are all, um, we have, like, we're all in this, um, race together to try to break you know break glass ceilings and break barriers and and to empower each other to just um to uplift each other so if i had to sum it up it would be sometimes the barriers are, are those three things are the patriarchy self-sabotage and then sometimes are are the folks who we hope are our allies um aren't at times Yeah, so I really like the direction this took. Honestly, me personally, like I never really saw how much like how much you could take control of it yourself, right? Um, 
and I feel like that's a totally new perspective for me um, I feel like I'm learning as we're going and um, I know we kind of like touched on this already but I kind of want to touch on this specifically I want to know why do you believe women specifically need more support in the workplace because we're about a century behind the, the men, if not more. Um, you, you do see it improving a little bit. Uh, I think right now, and I was going to look up the statistic and I, I didn't have time, but you know, right now, at least in law school, there's been a little bit of a shift where there are more women that are attending law school. You know, and that's one area where there's still a lot of bias against women but you can see it slowly, uh, slowly getting better. And I know the law schools have been reaching out uh, to women and underrepresented groups to try to build that diversity and to get, uh, to get everybody in there and represented. But we do need that help because in terms of, for example, feeling good about ourselves, you know, how many times, and maybe not so much for the younger generation here, but how many times have you been told, oh, you're a woman, you can't do anything except, you know, stay at home and bake cookies and have kids, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, we need to lift each other, we need to empower each other, so to speak. Um, we're starting way behind the mark when we're coming into the workplace. And that's why we do need that help. We need the mentors. We need the system. We need those changes. And I, and I think we have to start with ourselves. You can't walk into the office or, or the classroom or wherever you're going expecting to be uh, greeted and high-fived and hey, start with you. You make that approach. Y you make that first step to embrace the woman in front of you or next to you. Um, and, and the thing is, is part of the inclusion, the um, equity, it, we have to teach people how to be sometimes. And I know that sounds maybe simplified, but you know, it's kind of like the golden rule or set the example, you know, be the person you want people to be to you. Um, so it, it sounds simple sometimes, but it, it really works and it, and it, um, it'll grow quickly, but be that person that you want people to be to you um, and teach them how to be there for you. And and, you know, um, when you see someone that that maybe you can work with or um, collaborate with or just take a chance and introduce yourself and, and offer to be that support, um, because it's going to come back to you when you do good things, good things happen. Um, and, and we have to stay positive and we have to create a momentum that that we're proud of. Um, so I say be that person you want them to be and, and set the example. Okay, so I'm just going to address the, you know, elephant in the room here. Um, so it's biology. <laughs> um, most of us have faced or will face childbearing, and it is enormously exhausting physically. I think it's, it's really difficult to recover from childbirth. Um, if you are the primary caregiver, and an infant might have an erratic sleep schedule, and you get six weeks of maternity leave. And I think that is a public policy problem. Um, so I did it in my 20s. I was exhausted, um, but I had the energy. But in my 30s, I was bedridden the last four months of pregnancy. And then I had a preemie on a heart monitor, and I could not continue to work. There just were not enough days of leave for me to continue. I was the managing editor of a business magazine, a national magazine. And so I dropped out of the workforce for four years. Um, and I just freelanced for magazines. And when I tried to re-enter, I needed to go back in at an entry level. I had lost 50% of my earning power during those years of childbearing and taking care of a small child. And I'm the oldest and I have seven sisters. And I just never imagined this was problematic. I just always thought I could have it all as a, a woman who started her career in the 90s. It did not occur to me this was going to be a problem. 
Um, and it took me 10 years after I re-entered the workforce to get to the earning level that I was at when I dropped out to have that baby. So, I mean, be realistic about it. There's a biological issue of bearing children that is not supported by public policy. And in fact, I got called back into work with my first child after two weeks. I still did not have clearance to drive because I'd had a rigorous childbirth and my employer demanded I show up for a client meeting with an infant. I mean, these things happen to women all the time. And um, until the policy changes, it's not gonna stop. Yeah, so I feel like definitely like branching off what um, Pamela, what you just left us off with. Um, this next question has to do a lot to do with that. Um, I want to know, like, how do you envision a workplace with more empowered women would look like or, um, so to speak, like a workplace that serves more for women, right? Whether that be like more maternity leave or like um, equal pay to start. <laughs> like, um, I just want to hear you guys' like ideas on that. I think some of that's kind of kind of basic what we'd like to see is the equal pay, uh, the equal responsibility, you know, in, in some law firms, you know, the male partners get assigned the big cases that have the big hourly rate, hourly billables, uh, because that gender bias, right? Um, the men can, are supporting their family, so they need that, those extra hours and those extra bonuses, the women, you know, whatever. Um, so equal pay for equal work is a start, uh, equal collaboration, you know, the female perspective in handling a divorce case can be quite divergent from a male perspective. How often, how often do the attorneys, and, and I'm just citing the law practice because that's what I know, how often do they get together and they talk about these issues or how to deal with a difficult client? Is there that collaboration? You know, is there freedom to talk to each other? Um, is there a robust maternity leave, robust vacation policy? Are there policies, right? Um, I've worked for some firms that had no policies whatsoever and everything was a question. Well, can I take this day off? Um, I've got a daycare issue. What can I do about it? And there's no policy in place. So you want some place that's got a written handbook that um, takes care of these issues up front. You know, sometimes we go into the inner job interview and we don't ask those questions. Um, and maybe we start by doing that, you know, when they say, what, what do you envision this job to be? You know, talk about the duties and then talk about is it, you know, is this a collaborative environment? Um, do, how is the interaction between your male staff and your female staff? There's nothing wrong with asking questions in a job interview, right? And if you get pushback from that, then you know that's not where you want to be, right? But that's where communication is open and everybody treats each other with respect that's the place you want to be and that's the ideal workplace that's where i want to work right so i feel like what well, you said like bringing up questions in an interview i feel like you know most people would be afraid of bringing up questions in an interview like afraid of being like too pushy or like oh like what if they don't like me what if they don't like these questions but you brought up you brought up a good point where if there's pushback like that's not where you want to be um and just to wrap this up last question i just want to know what advice would you give to women who want to work in fields that traditionally lack women representation I think somebody said it earlier, be bold, be bold. And I, I wouldn't go in with that mindset. I wouldn't go in with, well, this is a field that traditionally lacks women representation. I would go in with, this is a field where I'm going to break and break, be bold and break some barriers and glass ceilings and bring five other women with me. 
you know, be in a position of power or leadership so that I can hire more women so that that initial statement or question is, is, is just irrelevant in the future. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing, be bold too, but have confidence in yourself. You know what your skills are. You know what your abilities are. And if you aren't feeling all that confident, when I was first uh, starting out as a trial attorney, I would picture, and I keep going back to LA law, but you know, I watched it a lot. I keep going back to that scene in the opening opening line where they burst through the courtroom door and walk in all confident. I think, you know what? I can do that. I can walk in confidently through the door and I can do that. If I can take that first step, I'm there. And then you just go from there. Don't expect everything to be, you know, all, don't expect to be all together right at the start. Realize you're going to make mistakes. Realize there are people that are going to try to step on you and be prepared for that right? Don't let it get you down. You pick I yourself up and you keep going. Chandra, that is the key. You have to be prepared for opposition and simply an outright refusal to receive direction, sometimes coaching or course correction, because the opposition is formed by historical role modeling in the home usually. So if they've not seen a woman lead in their lives, it's not going to occur to them that a woman is the leader. And so you just need to know the opposition isn't personal. It's simply cultural and historical, probably. Yeah. And then I was just going to say, just do it. Just do it. Um, because you're doing it because you're passionate about it. You, you're interested in it. You want to succeed in it. You want, sometimes if we take those other things out of it, you might be the only woman uh, but know this, it's not going to be easy. But also know this, what good things are, right? So it's worth it. Show up, be consistent, and stay connected. Know what's going on. Know who the players are. Know who can mentor. Get involved. And then reach out and see, maybe in this area, there's not a lot of women. But outside these areas, who in that industry has women in those areas that you can reach out to get mentorship? Um, so I, I say just do it. it, it it's going to be tough but it'll be worth it. And, and you will find what there's very little things that you can do that not one woman has ever done before. So, uh, and kudos to you if you find that. We'll figure it out. We'll help you find somebody to connect with. But there's always going to be someone somewhere, somehow that we can get some mentorship to help get you through it. But uh, if you're passionate about it, you care about it, you want to do it, Yeah, so, oh my God, I'm so sorry. My voice is like going away. I'm kind of sick. Um, But I feel like it's very important to like not take anything as like a self-sabotaging way. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. I'm like totally sick. Um, But yeah, I just want to kind of open up like the chat to like any questions or like turn on your mic to ask any questions before we leave. Um. We'll kind of like stick around for like maybe five more minutes if that's a, something everybody's cool with. I was just going to mention this anecdote that I was thinking of when you sent me these questions. Do y'all remember that dad on the BBC who got photobombed on an interview by his little kid who wheeled into the room and he was about two years old? And I was just thinking about how much has changed actually since the pandemic when we all saw women in Zoom conference rooms with kids on their lap. And so that issue has come to the front that women sometimes have different responsibilities and, um, and families um, are a part of workplace and workplace boundaries. So I feel like, yeah, like as like 
as someone who like doesn't have to like um go through that every day like that's just something that you probably won't think about but when you are like a mother you know that's something that is brought to your attention um like me I probably wouldn't have thought about that I'm not a mother <laughs> but um I think that's what's important bringing everything to light and like letting it be known that like there is change that needs to be made all right, so I've been checking out the chat and I don't see any questions for anyone. Um, it is a little bit after seven o'clock. Sorry to keep everyone a little over, I apologize. Um, thank you all again for being here. We are so happy to have you. We appreciate all of your nuggets of wisdom, especially since I think, um, Pamela, you mentioned in the chat for us younger folks in calm as we go forward, we can carry all of this knowledge with us. And we appreciate all of you being here to share that knowledge with us. Goodbye, everyone. Have a great night. Bye, everyone. night. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you to everyone listening. I hope you enjoyed the discussion. And thank you to the Communications Club for partnering with us. The Communications Club meets Tuesdays at 4 p.m. via Zoom. And you can find the talent on all social media at MSJC Talent and visit us online at msjctalentnews.com.